Parsifal is very much a last work. Um, many great artists have had last works and the works that were seen as last works um, by the artists themselves. There's two kinds of last works. There's works and the, the, that the artist simply doesn't make anymore afterwards because um, fate strikes the artist down. They um, no, no longer write or they are no longer able to write or they die or whatever. But there are other works that the, the, the writer clearly envisions as being a summation, as a, the final say, the, the, um, uh, the, the last work of a piece, of, of a life's oeuvre. Um, I guess the most famous example in history might well be Shakespeare's Tempest, which he, whether or not it's actually his physical last work, I mean, I think it's, it probably is, but it's not entirely sure. It just breathes the fact <clears throat> it has the famous speech where, <clears throat> You know, Prospero just says he's going, he's not going to write anymore. He's 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 throwing away his book. He's burying his wand, whatever it is. Was it forty fathoms deep? Um, um, there are other uh, famous works uh, in history like this, where uh, Goethe's Faust is an interesting one, where Goethe, in a way, delays writing the end of his second part of Faust until practically right before he dies. Precisely in a way, with this almost, with you could say. An, tragic or whatever for vision that his life will be summed up by what will be the ending of his great masterpiece. And Parsifal in some ways is such a work even though um, it, was, it was written shortly before Wagner died. He finished Parsifal only uh, a year before he died. And, um, but I think that there are a lot of ways in which Parsifal is the last work and I think that this brings both Parsifal's extraordinary richness but also um, some of Parsifal's potential uh, snares, uh, potential um, difficulties, problems even, let's say. Um, one of the things that I think I've spoken about a lot over the years here, that I find the most remarkable about Wagner and the most different th um, about Wagner from almost any other composers that I can think of, and really also writers, dramatists, but composers in particular, is that Wagner does not repeat himself. Um, all through his career, he is extraordinarily able to find a new voice, new sound, new technique, new means for each work. Um, it would be interesting to try sometime, but I think that even with a relatively inexperienced group, I mean, a fairly experienced, but not certainly a professional group, if we played what they used to call drop the needle, back when we had needles and, and record players, but, um, and just little short fragments at random from works from Flying Dutchman on, and probably even before, really, but Flying Dutchman on, um, it, just and say, which, which work is it? I think a remarkably high percentage of people would get a remarkably high percentage correct, because the works sound very different one from the other. Each has very much its own sound. And this, by the way, is also very true of Parsifal, although I think in some cases for rather ironic reasons, but still, definitely, it has its own sound. Um, and and the, my whole talk tomorrow is largely about Parsifal sound, uh, aspects of Parsifal sound, which are different from other works. But what I'm talking about tonight also is in a way that Parsifal is different from the works. So Wagner really, and even within the ring, I find, I think that Rheingold has its sound and, and Valkyra has its, even though the ring has all the same material, basically, there's very little material in the ring that doesn't in some form or another appear in, in at least one of the others, and in some cases all the others, nevertheless, each one has its own sound. That sounds like Gunnar Demering, it's a certain sort, of, or that sounds, this very clear, transparent, kind of cutting sound that's, that's typical of Rheingold, et cetera. Um, and this is certainly true of Parsifal. There's one thing about Parsifal, though, right off the bat, which is extraordinarily different from any of the other um, major works of Wagner. And that's something I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, Parsifal, maybe because of its long gestation, although I don't think so. I think that's part of it, but many other Wagner works have long gestations. Parsifal quotes, or not so much quotes as refers to almost all of other Wagner's works, and does so a great deal, almost continuously. Now, Wagner does quote um, his other works occasionally, and not quote exactly, but well, he does quote. Anybody come up with a quote? We're not doing a quiz. 
Meistersinger, of course, he quotes twice within one short scene. Um, um, Tristat. And of course, that's a perfect example of just how different the work sound. It literally sounds like an invader from a foreign universe. <clears throat> I mean, it's a completely different sound. Um, and there are actually, there's maybe quotes or at least allusions also in the quintet of Meistersinger where he seems to refer not just to Tristan but also to the ring for a second, but that's a little bit less um, uh, obvious. But by and large, um, Wagner manages not, to, you know, composers, uh, for instance, Beethoven. Let me just talk a second about that. Um, it's not that Beethoven copies himself or imitates himself. Beethoven is an incredibly creative man, and each of his 32 piano sonatas, each of his 16 string quartets, each of his nine symphonies is very different. Nevertheless, Beethoven finds a kind of model, sort of, sort of dramatic model that works very well, and he repeats it not a lot of times, but quite a few times. For instance, the model of <clears throat> starting in a minor key, having a lot of struggle, and finally winning it out for major, and the major wins, the sort of fifth symphony model. And he does that in more than one piece. Or um, the big struggle where we think it's gonna come out okay, and it doesn't, and it ends in tragedy, like the Appassionata. And he does that in some, there, and there are certain sort of forms which he does, he does them in different ways. He does them, and, and of course, all great writers do that too, after all. I mean, um, even the greatest novelists, even uh, Thomas Mann or Dostoevsky or, or Dickens, um, their books are different one from the other, but they have a certain kind of, almost within just traditional molds of, of, of ways they can go. Um, Wagner really, to a large extent, avoids that. The, the um, Parsifal, um, doesn't sound like and doesn't work like any of the other works, but neither does Tristan or neither does Meistersinger, neither does Lohengrin for that matter. <clears throat> but one way in which Parsifal is different is this constant allusion to the other works. Now I think that one reason is precisely because Wagner is summing up his career. It's as if you know someone at the end of his life is going to write um, is going to write something which is going to be his last statement. You know, you probably all know the story that when Wagner finished the, the Ring. He announced to the world and wrote on the score that he was done writing music dramas. He was going to dedicate himself to, um, presumably, to instrumental music, to non-dramatic instrumental music. He never wrote anything of that, but that's pr presumably what he was going to do. Um, but instead, he wrote Parsifal, or he came back to a, a subject that had interested him for a long time, that he'd already written pro sketch for, that he presumably had had musical ideas about. I'm almost convinced he did. Um, and wrote it, and, and some people say, have said, that this was Cosima um, wanting him to have a Christian work after the pagan ring. <clears throat> Other people have said that Wagner himself was uh, strongly motivated to do it, to have a work that would be only Bayreuth, and so that Bayreuth would have, the people would have to go to Bayreuth to hear this piece, so there would be a, almost a commercial reason for it. And there are probably multiple reasons, I mean, for it. But whatever he, Wagner, maybe there's just an inner compulsion but perhaps not the kind of intercompulsion there had been to write The Ring, let's say, or to write Tristan, certainly, um, to come and, and go back to this and, and to write Parsifal. But when he does it, he writes, this is going to be, and he says this in lots of letters and things, this is going to crown my career. It's going to be the last thing that's going to sort of crown my career with a kind of um, ritualistic and almost holy, using a word in a broad sense, but in a way that Wagner would probably use it. Um, um, uh, almost consecration work, and he calls it a consecration, a theater consecration work. That's the, 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 the Bündenweih uh, Kunstwerk is, is Parsifal. <clears throat> and in this work, he looks back on all of his work, certainly from Lohengrin, and I suspect also Tannhäuser, and uses elements from these works, or ideas from these works, to create a completely different work <clears throat> with a completely different sound. Sometimes I think that the success of Parsifal depends upon Wagner's ability to make the material that he takes from earlier works <clears throat> appropriate to the new scenario. So let's look at some of this. <clears throat> if I play, I don't have to talk. <clears throat> I'm going to start with a, a, an egregious example. An, a, a, and if, if someone were to say to me, is there anything really problematic in Parsifal? I would have two answers, and, th and this would be part of them. And I'll even refer to the other one in a second. Um, 
And this is the Parsifal motive itself. Parsifal, there's not a lot of motives in Parsifal that have a strong or even any kind of precise um, relationship with elements in the drama. The, the, the motives in Mars, Parsifal are no longer like the ones in The Ring. They're not even really like the ones in Meistersinger or Tristan. <clears throat> the ones in Tristan are pretty much symphonic and have occasional strong, there are a couple that have strong references. The ones in Parsifal, <clears throat> as I thought Simon very accurately said, almost feel like that they're commenting on some kind of almost outside value. They're, they have a meaning. You know, it's fine and dandy to call this the grail motive and this the Eucharist motive and this the spear or this faith or this, but there's no real reason to. Those are just nice words, but they certainly sound extremely luminous and sound very strongly like they have a great s significance, but not necessarily a significance which directly relates to the person who's speaking or to the situation in which they're speaking, not in the direct one-to-one -one kind of way that we see in the ring, where in a, in a way, the reality of the ring, the music is the drama. And this is something that I was in this rather controversial work that, um, that Simon and I were discussing, this, what's The Ring of Truth, I guess it's called, by, uh, by Scruton, um, which I find to be a, a, a book that everyone really should read. Um, he really points out that the music is not a description of the action of the ring, nor is it even an enhancement of the action of the ring. The music is the action of the ring. What really happens in the ring is the music. You could almost say that the action is a description or a sort of acting out of what is really happening in the music. But the reality of what happens is the music. I think that's very accurate. And he says it much better and goes into, into detail. First of all, it's a little bit different, certainly. It's certainly true. I mean, it seems like that the music has this luminous quality, but which kind of relates to the action, but not in any kind of easily definable one-to-one -one way. But nevertheless, there are a few moments, a few motives, which do have clear-cut one-to-one um, uh, associative meaning. It which, of course, is Parsifal. And we know it's Parsifal. He comes on stage and he sings it, and it's, there, there he is. And it changes. I mean, for instance, when he comes on stage in Act Three, and he's much older and seems very solemn, it, we hear. Or, he ch does change the chord there once. Um, <clears throat> but it's an extraordinarily simple-minded melody, it seems to me. <clears throat> A very, um, very old-fashioned kind of, of motif. One that reminds me extremely of... Everybody know what that is, where it comes from? That's Lohengrin. That's Lohengrin's motive, which we hear also when he first comes on. Actually, we hear it in Elsa's dream when she imagines the knight in white armor. Now, the fact is, now, I, I don't want people starting to throw stones at me yet. I'm, I love Parsifal, but I'm going to start off with sort of the thing with the bottom, let's say, or the most problematic. Whereas I think that this theme, the, is very appropriate to Lohengrin and very appropriate to the world in which Lohengrin lives and to the opera. I think that this is utterly and completely inappropriate to Parsifal. Yes, it describes his brashness when he first comes in to some extent, but that's about all. Um, this has this kind of, here comes, the, here comes the good guys. The man in the white hat is arriving. The lone ranger is on his way. But Parsifal is anything but that kind of hero. If, if hero he be, he's not that kind of hero. He's not the, you know, he may be the great salvation. He may be the savior of the, of, of the Knights of the Grail, but it's a different kind of salvation and a different kind of hero. So it's questionable to me whether this theme, which I think that Wagner pulled up from an earlier work because he wants to show the relationship between, after all, Lohengrin in its own way is also about the grail and also Lohengrin himself is the son of Parsifal. He wants some kind of relationship. So he writes a theme which is not exactly so much related as they're, they, they, they very much are cut from the same cloth, as it were. It's something he does when Parsifal is in, is in excelsis at the end, when um, he's been knighted and he's in his grand glory. It's <laughs> strikes me as being even less appropriate. 
Maybe he has become something grand and, 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 and glorious um, by the third act. But the kind of grand and glorious music that this seems to depict is complete. This, this is the, the, the guy who's just fought 1,500 dragons and 36,000 black villains in, in armor and slain them all. And this is a guy instead, Parsifal, who hasn't fought anybody. He killed one poor little innocent swan. And after that, all we see him do is break his bow in half. And he finally does get a spear with which he refuses to fight. So this is, this, this is not music that strikes me as being all appropriate for the character. Now, what he's done with the theme that last time is exactly what he did to Siegfried. Now, Siegfried has, as a young guy, well, that's completely appropriate. The horn, the outdoors, everything we, we, he breathes through. And then when he becomes a, a big grown-up after he walks out of his, whether it's nights, weeks, or months, with Brunhilde, he's... You know, it's, it's all grand and everything. But that seems to fit better, especially in the funeral march, the, 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 the kind of hero Siegfried is than the kind of hero the Parsifal is. So there is a danger sometimes, I think, for Wagner um, in taking music from the earlier works or the style of the, other, the earlier works and putting it into his new, completely different kind of ritual drama um, to find an adaptability, to find a, uh, the, the, something that actually is appropriate. There's something else from Lohengrin, several things actually, that are very strong uh, deaths from Lohengrin. Um, you know, at the beginning of Lohengrin, of course, we have the very great, the Etc. Okay, I'm just gonna okay. That harmonic regression is just like the, the core of, of all the sort of religious music in parts of all the Grail music, the music associated with things having to do with the Grail. That particular harmonic regression just completely suffuses all through Parsifal. That's certainly not an accident. I mean, that's again, but that one works great. By the way, another way he uses that same. Um, a very specific borrowing from this. That, of course, anybody know what that is? What's going on here? It's the swan. Well, it's the same swan music we had in Lohengrin. I don't have it with me, but it's... Mine, mine, Lieber Schwan. It's very closely related to almost the same music exactly, just concentrates on the two chords. <clears throat> the swan music in Parsifal is identical to the swan music in, in Lohengrin. It's orchestrated differently. That's more of a subject for tomorrow. Um, it sounds different in the context, but it's the same music. Well, that's an obvious borrowing. You know, what, what's, what's, good for, what's good for the goose is good for the. Uh, um, Certainly, sorry, I couldn't resist that one. <laughs> anyway, um, so that, that is a borrowing. There's, a, to my mind, one small borrowing, I don't know if borrowing is the right word, one, one homage to or reminiscence of the world of Tannhäuser in um, Parsifal. In, in Tannhäuser during the Rome narration, actually we hear it the prelude to the third act too, but mostly the Rome nation we have. which is very much like it goes the other way but it's very much the same world again and maybe that's you could say sort of generic uh, in the one case he's describing the pilgrims all going to Rome and and and, the, and this it's one of the most important motives in Parsifal which is usually called the faith motive for no particularly good reason but it certainly sounds religious and you know, so it's, I've, I don't know if it's, it's, you could say it's, it's a tie or reminiscence of, 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 of Tannhäuser, but it contains an element which we've already heard in Tannhäuser. Now, if it's, let's go for a second to that theme and um, let's listen to it, gosh, any time we want to, really, but we're just right here.
and in some ways, this isn't the best example because it's very directional. It's starting a big crescendo from the prelude. But I could pick others. But this, uh, for my purposes, this is fine. Notice how he's, he's, he, there's a melody with imitation. Imitation means that something else happens that sounds almost the same. We have they're the same, and they follow the other. Um, and, and they all sort of meld together very beautifully in a, in, in a kind of very specific kind of polyphony. That means more than one voice going on at once. You know, phony means sound, poly means many sounds. Um, and, and this kind of polyphony, this kind of voices imitating each other in close sort of range, is very, very close to chorales. It's very, it, it harkens up exactly the kind of singing that we hear in Lutheran chorales, that we would hear, um, for instance, I mean, and, you know, one of those, but also, what is that? Meistersinger, exactly. There's no way that Wagner could have or would have written in all this without having written Meistersinger before. Once that is planted in your heads, by the way, you will not be able to hear it without hearing the, the, the chorale stuff in Meistersinger. Scenes with David, um, the scene right before the quintet. The Meistersinger was an enormous sort of fun learning experience for, for Wagner, and he was getting really getting into the world of Lutheran chorales and chorale style and that kind of traditional uh, polyphonic writing because it was part of the imagery, almost a metaphor for this, this, the, and of the, this world, the, the world of, 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 of 17th century Germany, that he's, or 16th century Germany, that he's depicting in, 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 in a lot of things that it stands for. So he um, is having lots of fun. I think one of the uh, great joys of Wagner's life as a composer was when he got into Meistersinger um, the sort of mastering and working with this very archaic form for him. Um, uh, it was very hard for him. Meistersinger took him a remarkably long time to write this. I think it was not easy to him. It didn't come to him naturally in a way, but it was lots of fun. I think he, there's lots of evidence that I think he really, whereas writing Tristan was this almost an agony because it was like this incredible compulsion. It was, the letters, when you're writing Tristan, he was constantly saying, I can't believe what's coming out of me. No one's going to be able to hear this stuff. I mean, they're all going to go mad. My string, I think he's just having, he says, you know, I worked all day and wished I could work all night. You know, it was just, it's so much fun to, to do all this, this kind of polyphonic things. And he picks it up again a little bit in, in, um, in Parsifal. Okay, let's talk about something else. So Parsifal starts with a very unusual and I think unique sounding. on. So how would you describe that beginning? I mean, it's certainly um, unique, um, pensive, yeah, well, it's certainly, but he wrote a lot of pensive music. Like it's, uh, very rich, but in a way, it's exactly the opposite of rich. I'm not contradicting you, but reverential, reverential sorry, yes, that it does sound. Um, reverential because, in a way, I think because it doesn't pull us anywhere. It doesn't go anywhere. We're not, at least this first statement of the theme, it stays remarkably in one place. It sort of, it creates this amazing, it's very daring. The composer, when he starts a piece of music, the first thing he has to think about is, how am I gonna grab the listener? How am I gonna pull them in? How am I gonna keep their attention? So, he, to do that with something that harmonically is going nowhere, There's a little bit here. What's lacking? What's, yeah, what's lacking? There's something incredibly important, yes? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, okay, well, okay, the meter is right. It has a very, very ambiguous meter. You can't, you can't clear, it's not clear at all what's the, what are the beats, where it's going, where are the beats, where are the phrase is going, what's happening. But there's something else, something, you, nobody's hit upon the most obvious thing. What's lacking? There's no harmony. It's by itself. There's one line, one line. I can play with one finger, right? Just that, just one single line of music with no harmony. We have a term for that, it's called monody or monophonic music, one, one sound, one line. Now, what, there's one period of music history that's very famous for this. Anybody know what it is? Gregorian chant, the beginning of Gregorian chant. So Wagner is to some extent referring to Gregorian chant. He's referring to it because Gregorian chant is also has no meter, no implied harmony. This has some implied harmony, but not much and doesn't particularly go anywhere. It, has, it creates a tremendous sense of timelessness. Gregorian chant has become very in these days, and people listen to, what's Hildegard von Bingen, or what's her name? Um, but um, it, it has this, this, this complete lack of harmonic, it's, it's one single line. Now, one of the interesting things is, is that this sound, the sound of the opening of Farsafal, and we're gonna talk about this sound a lot tomorrow. We've, we've already heard the first part of the prelude, the parts of fall several times, and we're going to hear it a bunch more tomorrow too in my talk because it's really it's really the key to the whole sound of parts of fall. But it's not that Wagner only writes one-line music, monophonic music in parts of fall. Wagner is already one of the great great masters of monophonic music. Can anybody think of any passages, famous long passages for one one line in other works of Wagner? That's a good one. Okay. What about this one? Yeah. This is a better one. Prelude to the third act of Tristan. This one goes on even longer than the one that Parsifal does. It also creates a sense of timelessness, but, and it doesn't have a clear sense of direction either, but it does have, it doesn't seem unruffled. It doesn't seem un, it's got also, I mean, right off the bat. It's jagged, whereas this is so smooth. Let's make another one just at random. Um, there's so many of them. Wagner is amazingly good at these uh, long lines. Here there's a chord and I'm not going to play it. Where does this come from? Siegfried Act Three. He's just arrived, just gone through the fire, and he's just arrived up, at, and he's all sort of um, intoxicated. And uh, there's a great German word, entlückt. How do we translate entlückt? Help? No, that was entäuscht. No, entlückt. Um, enraptured. Thank you. Um, enraptured, just sort of by this this whole thing. Um, 
but it's this incredibly long line. And, but it, it's, now the, it, the value of this is it makes us appreciate the difference of Parsifal. He is going back to something. Now, it's true. There's a big difference between having this in the middle of a big drama after an uh, extremely loud and fantastic dramatic encounter <laughs> Excuse me. between Siegfried and the Wanderer breaking the spear and then going through the fire, this incredible uh, panoply of sound and amazing orchestration, and then having it all subside into this huge long violin solo is quite different than actually starting a piece with it. Another big difference, precisely, is it is a violin solo. It's, it's the whole violin section, but just violins. Whereas beginning the parts of all this, not. That's we'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, but even here, see again, the Parsifal stays so con con contained. This goes all over the place. It, it could go on forever, but it feels it certainly, even though it seems enraptured and it it, it, and it doesn't feel static in the same way. It doesn't have this sort of completely stopped time or time completely with, it seems timeless, but not stopped in the same kind of way that the opening of, of Parsifal. Now the opening of Parsifal does change when he repeats it in the minor. Something does happen there. Now, the second phrase, like the first phrase, ends where it started. The first phrase. The second phrase. That has nothing to do with it. That's gone someplace else. And then it comes back. So, it has harmonic. The whole harmony is basically just a question of, of creating dyna dynamic situations, something that changes in time, by going away and coming back. So the first phrase has, in a way, almost no harmonic context at all in itself, because it just stays on one plane. The second one goes, it has a, a surprising change right at the, the moment of, of most tension, and then comes back. So there's already, it's already a more dynamic phrase than the first one. Does everybody hear that? Shall I play it again? Yeah, between. Second one. So it's just in the minor. It's back. Now he makes a lot of that when he repeats it with harmony later, which you can hear tomorrow, but. Nevertheless, I have a whole other long list of, of passages in the Ring. The Ring and Tristan both have long, have great passages for just solos. Actually, there is another act. Um, um, it ends with a solo. Begins with a solo. What is this? The Hans Sachs, the beginning of Act Three of. Um, Meister singer. So Wagner is great. You know, we always think of Wagner as being this, the great revolution in harmony and this incredibly important harmonic composer. But Wagner is really good at these single lines. But the, the single lines in Parsifal, this very significant one, has a quality all its own. There's other reasons for the quality, which I'll talk about tomorrow, which have to do with the, the, the use of the orchestra. Wagner, Wagner uses the orchestra very differently in Parsifal than he does in any of his other works. But that's OK. Um, Okay, another very big thing in Wagner, that, that it's all through Wagner, but it's very big in Parsifal, is um, if I play the, well. Everybody hear 
Everybody recognize that? The Tarnhelm. Although actually, you know, that, the Scruton refuses to call the Tarnhelm and calls it Fervanlun, transformation, which is great because then it covers all of its bases. Because it's the same as... When Brunhilde wakes up, one of the great moments in opera, um, but it's the same music as the Tarnhelm. It's just slowed down beyond recognition. But the idea is, is that, in, in a, in just in a, in a funny, superficial kind of way, the Tarnhelm changes uh, Albrecht into another form, in a way Brunhilde, as she wakes up, is coming out of a cocoon. She's also changing forms in a way. Or and another example of the, the same kinds of chords being strung together. We usually call that magic sleep, but again, Fervon, his, his title's good. Because it's, it seems, it's not really, it's about, she's going, going through a change of state there too, and we hear it lots of other times when that's a much better name for it than just calling it magic sleep. But they're based on a certain kind of chord progression. I don't think it's necessary for me to go into how that, what that chord progression is, but it's a certain sound, or they're moving in a funny way, not the usual. It's not a different kind of chord progression. Well, he does it all over Parsifal too. And, and, we're, and in the ring, it seems to stand for some kind of, let's say, magical transformation. It does in Parsifal, too. Here, I just pulled one out of the hat. It, it comes a million times, but something like this. All these weird chord stuff. I mean, there's lots of other passages I could pick, but especially we get to the end, well, Does more and more of that. Every, what is, every, what can this is referring to? This is actually a motive that does refer to something. It's, it's parts of all, it's the, it's the Reiner Tor, it's the innocent fool. Um, but it, it, it seems to have some magical or transformative, transformation quality about it as well. And so um, it's very, very similar to um, music in, in the ring. This is, um, to me, to my ears, it harkens immediately to ring stuff. I could even uh, find one-to-one, -one, but I, I want to go on. You know, um, I've heard lots of people say that the flower maids, the Blumen Mädchen, um, don't sound like anything else in Wagner, and that um, he's really just fallen into uh, French operetta, especially when they really get going into their Komm Holderknabe. Does that remind you of anything else in Wagner? Yes, of course. Now I gave it away. I mean. Even the same chords, basically. He just makes a longer line of it. And... Very French sounding, if, if taken out of context, a little, uh, little turn. Da -da -da -dum, da -da -da -dum. It's just 
right out of, again, the, the Rhine Mains. The so it's, um, you know, very much, Wagner's very good at conjuring up the sort of never, never land. Now, however, there is something quite different about the, the Rhine Maidens and the Parsifal music. And because the Parsifal music is, contains very close relation to the Rhine Maidens, but it contains a very close relationship to something else. on and on here. Anyway, what's happening? It was better actually before, even if I just play that. What, 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 he's in one key and then he goes to another very far away key all of a sudden. Here too. You hear there's a big, the big surprise. It feels as if the floor has dropped out from underneath you. And it keeps on doing it over and over and over again. This kind of, and what, what this creates, of course, is an enormous sense of, of, of kind of, um, you're losing your contact with, 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 with reality. It, it very much increases the, the sense of sort of never, never land or, or fantasy, but also it adds, I think, an enormous element of sensuality. <clears throat> in, in, in music, for centuries, music harkens up sensuality by surprise, by harmonies that don't, it's pretty hard to sound sensual with just, they, they, you know, it just seems too, but, but if you have harmonies like that kind of thing does, it should be no surprise that the source of this music, or at least a very close cousin, comes from what's Wagner's probably most sensual work, Tristan. Second act of Tristan is full of, for instance, those kind of modulations where every time it's just the same music exactly, actually. <clears throat> the context is so completely different. You don't, well, once you hear it, you hear it. So Wagner is, is, he is not exactly repeating himself, but he's using himself. This, this scene is a funny combination of the Rhine Maidens visiting uh, uh, the love duet of Tristan. What he's done, of course, is he's taken all the innocence out of the Rhine Maidens. Um, the Rhine Mains, in spite of the fact that in Gutter Dammerung, not the same girls they were at the uh, beginning of Rheingold by any means, they still retain a certain, you call of nature, innocence. Whereas, of course, the, the Blue Mansion have no innocence at all. Or at least, if they do, it's a different kind of innocence completely. But certainly, it's an innocence full of sensuality. <clears throat> and, he de and he depicts that, and he depicts that using a harmonic trick, if you want to call it, or harmonic effect that, that is very prominent in the second act of Tristan. Can you hear that? Do I need to play that again or you can all hear that? The, the similarity between and it's the same kind of modulation. These, uh, uh, so where you, the last chord of the world you expect is what you get and yet it sounds perfectly right. That's, I guess, the, you know, that, that's the trick. He does do that, and he does that in a very famous passage in, in, in Meistersinger too, in a completely different sort of way. And he, I mean, he does it a lot in a lot of pieces. But here, there's I think a clear contextual uh, connection to the second act of Tristan.